Now on for how Philip K. Dick's dark novel became one of the most prolific cult films of generations on the edge of Blade Runner. There's a moment in Philip K. Dick's 1968 novel The Androids Dream of Electric Sheep in which the bounty hunter Rick Deckard wonders whether empathising with his android prey has put him at odds with the rest of the human race. He wondered, right stick, if any human has ever felt this way before about an android. That feeling of being out of sync with the world is a key element both of Dick's novel and of the film which followed, a film which was both behind and ahead of its time, which looked back to the future and redefined the way in which cinema would imagine the shape of things to come. It's a film which has been called everything from a fascinating failure to a cult classic, which looks more and more like dark prophecy as the years roll by and we move ever closer toward the edge of Blade Runner. I'm going through the eye of a needle when I'm making a movie and I'm writing it and you're either with me or you're not. If only you could have seen what I've seen with your eyes. Yeah. The filmmaking experience was wonderful. The film dealing experience was about as unpleasant as it can be. I'd go onto the set and I'd be in another world. The American people are basically anti-intellectual. They're not interested in novels of idea. And science fiction is essentially a field of ideas. Philip K. Dick is really one of the great unacknowledged writers of our time. Um, he was um, a Californian, and he wrote against the grain of what was currently accepted in the way of science fiction. Science fiction at that time was full of bold heroes going out into the universe, uh, conquering planets, conquering whole solar systems. And there was this extraordinary man, Philip K. Dick, uh, writing about really what was happening to him and to the drug culture in California with just a little twist of lemon. This is the house in San Rafael where Philip Dick wrote Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, one of a group of stories optioned during his lifetime that finally made it to the screen after his death. Like so much of Dick's fiction, it shot through with a surreal paranoid psychosis that seemed to echo his own state of mind. But with its futuristic bounty hunter theme, it also provided the basis for a saleable sci-fi screen romp, or so it seemed to actor-turned-writer Hampton Fancher. Philip K. Dick was a, a, a bit of a, a chimera. He was a bit of a monster. He was a bit elusive. You know, he was very appealing. I mean, he was very intelligent. He was very self-centered, kind of egomaniacal. He would do odd things. When he was talking to you, he would, you got the idea that he was, like, theatricalizing him. Anyway, Hampton. So he was getting a message from the gods. Phil, who had also made no bones about the fact that he had taken a lot of amphetamines early in his career to keep up the pace of being able to write as prolifically as he did, um, and had kept doing that for over a decade, it really became my conclusion that Phil, to a certain extent, was suffering from classic amphetamine psychosis. It didn't seem stupid at the time, because he was so brilliant. He was really smart. He was a you know, he was a scholar, he knew a lot of things, but he was, he dramatized himself. And I thought he was kind of crazy. Well, the police once told me that I was a crusader and they, they had no use for crusaders. But unfortunately, they didn't tell me what I was crusading for. <laughs> I, I, I was afraid to ask what it was I was a crusader for. And they told me that if I did not get out of the county, I would be shot in the back or worse some night. 
really the impetus of that novel, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, were some Nazi diaries that Dick had come across while doing research at the close stacks of the University of California at Berkeley in the library. And he was reading the journals of an officer, an SS officer, who had worked in one of these camps. And one of the entries really caught his attention. And the entry was, the screams of children keep me awake at night. And from that little seed, he began thinking, this person is not human. He cannot associate what he's just written. In other words, he's being bothered by the fact that they're exterminating all these thousands of people around him, because and he can't get a good night's sleep. So from that, Bill, uh, Phil inferred that Basically, these people weren't human. The Nazis were a synthetic organism. They were completely dissociated from human intercourse. And I think that really is what the spur of the entire Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep Blade Runner story started out as. He acted, I said to him, in fact, I said, you act like I'm some guy with sunglasses and a cigar who's come up in a convertible trying to make, take advantage of you. I'm not. I'm trying to get you to make this movie. and. Uh, and he kept kind of dismissing that idea of uh, Blade Runner, Android Dream, Electric Sheep. And the last time I saw him, I was, I was leaving. And, I, and I'm usually not this forward about these things, but I said, you know what? I'm not coming back because I don't think you like me. You really, in fact, I think you don't like me. And he said, no, you're wrong, Hampton, Hampton, you're wrong. You know, and he, he was kind of effusive at that moment, but I didn't go back. Despite Philip Dick's paranoia about America in general and Hollywood in particular, Hampton Fancher finally succeeded in fashioning a screenplay based on Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? This script, which would be retitled Dangerous Days and then Blade Runner, was eagerly adopted by Michael Dealey, producer of such varied fare as The Italian Job, The Deer Hunter and The Man Who Fell to Earth. I liked, for me, the originality of it. It was brand new stuff. It was, it was plausible. Um, I still think it's plausible. It contained a vision of the world which was possible. And I thought it was incredibly exciting, would be exciting on screen. Ridley was ideal in one respect, well, many respects, but one particular respect, which is that he has got the best eye of anybody directing film that I know about. I mean, anybody. And if you want to make a picture which looks stunning, as this picture had to do, then the best person you could get is Ridley. Something personal happened in my life. My elder brother died, and I... Uh, to coin a phrase, freaked out, felt, felt I had to go to work immediately. And so I called Michael and said, you know that film that, of, of Hamptons, I'd like to do it. And so uh, I went to Hollywood. And what I thought would be a fast, um, you know, fix emotionally, I'd get involved in something, uh, wasn't. And that developed into seven months of discussion every day with Hampton, coming to my house in L.A., going through the pages blow by blow. It wasn't until Ridley came in that it became an exterior film, a film that had a world. It was, a, it was, a, it was in hotel rooms, it was in basements. It was a, a, a $9 million movie that was all about interpersonal relationships. Enhanced 224 to 176. The thing about Hampton's screenplay was it was too enclosed within the confines of an apartment. The focus was, for me, how do we expand this film from you know, your, your vision, which is a, internal, uh, I want to follow Deckard outside. When I go outside, the world we see had better support a world that can actually reproduce human beings. And um, that's how it expanded. There was a moment where there's burnout with any writer and Hampton I think said I give up you know I can't do this anymore I need time out and uh, at that moment I'd also been reading uh, stuff of David Peoples um, and uh, I thought he came up with some very interesting dialogue. They put me in this 
fantastic suite in the Chateau Marmont sent a script over to me and said they'd be over in a couple hours. So I read the script and uh, my heart was broken because, I mean, they came in they said, you know, have you read the script? And I said, yeah. And they said, well, what'd you think? And I said, I think it's terrific. I said, I can't think of anything to do to improve it, right? And that was true, but apparently it was the right thing to say anyway because they both sort of beeped because I think they liked it too. But they said that Ridley had some thoughts about it or something and so on and so forth. And so to my amazement, I was hired to do a rewrite. I think what happened is I said to Hampton, look, there's this guy around who can come and do some of the city speaking, the dialogue. Um, what I want you to do is meet him and you tell me, because I felt it was so much his now, this you know, script, he's doing all the work, I'm just sitting there being creative. Um, and uh, he said, okay, he was uh, a little angry and a little hurt, I think, at the time. Ridley never came right out and said, if you don't do what I'm telling you to do, then we'll get somebody else to do it. That never was said. Ridley was shy, he's manipulative, you know, whatever, he didn't tell me. Hampton's a, an emotional person, um, like any other artist, and um, I don't, he can't have been happy at the whole idea of another writer coming in, and also at the changes that would make to his concept of the picture. I was devastated, I started of cry. I said, what do you mean? So, you know, I was, I got rat fucked. You know, I quit, I'm out, I'm gone. Then fuck you guys. And I called Ridley and said, I'm out of here, you know, and I was insane. I was so, I wanted my name off the picture, you know, it's like, I didn't want to be involved. But I needed to move on, because I, I was now seven months into this, and I, I would, felt I'd invested all my life into it as well. And this was going to be my next film, whether anyone liked it or not. And uh, so Hampton uh, met David, and I think they're still, they're still friends. I wouldn't talk to anybody. Uh, you know, in the company. And I'm sorry. No, it was f I mean, it was fine because, uh, because then towards the end, when they'd finished shooting the movie, they called me back in just before they finished shooting because it was a rooftop scene, all that stuff with, with gaff, you know. And, and so they asked me to come, I, David was working, I guess, or something, I don't know, because they asked me to come and rewrite some stuff. And that's when I rewrote you. I guess you're through, huh? Finished. Harrison Ford was probably the most interesting leading man. I, I, if I say at the time, it's a little unfair because he's still very interesting. But um, he was he was that, and so we, you know, we, we go for who's best. I remember the first time I met him was in the Meridiana. Where he came late; it was like ten o'clock, ten fifteen, and he was still wearing a leather jacket and a and a kind of wide-brimmed khaki hat, and he was unshaven. Of course, he was Indiana Jones. And he was, had come off the set to come and talk. And um, I figured anything that Spielberg and Lucas were going to do was going to be a really good, good for this actor. <laughs> so I thought, this is the guy. He's going to help us. You remember the spider that lived in a bush outside your window? Orange body, green legs. Watched her build a web all summer. And one day there's a big egg in it. The egg hatched. The egg hatched? And? And a hundred baby spiders came out. And they ate her. Sean was relatively unknown. Um, she'd done very little, very little at that time. And Ridley works on visuals ex extensively. He, he, you know, he's, he's a... A great as a director, he's a, is one of the most brilliant visualists I've ever met in my life, and he saw something in her visually that he wanted. She had to look great, as opposed to me just going with an actress who was a tourist. I'd always go with the actor first, actor, 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 capability first, look second. But you know, stars usually have that kind of combination of both. Do you like our owl? It's artificial? Of course it is. Must be expensive. Very. That was the happiest or best casting period I've ever had on a picture, except for a talent job, which was different. Um, it was wonderful because the, we had a completely blank page, really. And we went for people who were not comic, figures, I mean, not comic cuts type figures, um, were original looking. 
I had such a ball on this movie. I, I found that the, the future and the, the tethered look, the destroyed look of the future, the fact that he photographed a future that already was, that was already old. And I heard him say this when we were talking about the script and how he saw the movie. I, was, I thought it was so fascinating. The future is old. It's not new. We're no computers, Sebastian. We're physical. I think, Sebastian. Therefore, I am. When we did the screen test, we had set dressing. There was rain machines. There was smoke. There was a you know an alleyway with the garbage, and I mean, it just it was it was like lit like you wouldn't believe. I, I've I've yet to work on another film that is well lit and as well set designed as this screen test were for this film. It was just insane. What's your name? Chris. Mine's J.F. Sebastian. Hi. Hi. Anybody that says Ridley's not a genius, just look out there because there's more nationalities, more languages, and that's my opinion. It's more crowded than it was then. The film was about, about society's influence in, in, in day to day living. It showed Los Angeles many years from now being a cesspool. And 20 years ago, when that was made, as opposed to 20 years today, you can see where Mr. Scott's vision is coming to pass. I wasn't able to visualize what that picture was going to be because I hadn't worked on it at that time, nor did I really know what Ridley was going to do with it much more than when we sat down and talked about his uh, views of some of the things that he uh, was going to attempt to do. But uh, I just thought it was a, a good gamble uh, and something I could be probably proud of if it comes out the way uh, they hoped it would. This picture, you're building a world which hasn't yet been invented. And you've got somebody like Ridley inventing a world, <laughs> it's going to be quite some world. And that's the point of Ridley in this case, um, but also, of course, when it begins to cost money. The location of Philip Dick's original novel was San Francisco, 1992, a sparsely populated dump in the middle of a land laid waste by World War Terminus. During Blade Runner's various script rewrites, this transmuted into San Angeles, a teeming megalopolis that streamed along the length of the West Coast. During pre-production, some attempts were made to move that location to the chillier climes of the East, with a number of cities being scouted, including, most notably, New York, home of Ridley Scott's beloved Chrysler Building. But as each of these locations proved impractical, Blade Runner turned once again to the West and headed back to Hollywood. As it appears in the finished film, Deckard's turf is identified simply as Los Angeles 2019, a logical extension of that pollutedly glittering skyline, but peppered with nuances of New York architecture and drenched in typically eastern rain. The main street onto which that rain would fall was this, not actually a Los Angelian street at all, but the old New York set on the Warner Brothers backlot at Burbank, previously seen in such film noir classics as The Maltese Falcon and The Big Sleep, now retrofitted by Blade Runner's production team to create their huge futuristic vista. To get a picture that looks like Blade Runner is not a casual thing of building a set and chucking a few things around. And it isn't. It, it is a huge labour um, from the director's point of view. He has to build every corner of that screen. Every detail has to be as near perfect as he can get it. The so-called New York Street is sort of like uh, a series of uh, three different legs, which would mean six sides of the street, and we were going we to do all of it. And I was standing on this crossroads thinking, well, it's not very big. And uh, I got the production designer, Larry Paul, and then Sid Mead. And I got photographs taken of every side of the street and laid them out around the room, blew them up around the room. And uh, basically Sid and Larry started to construct the sides of the city. It was so dense with detail and texture 
that you could shoot elements onto the street in various areas and go from point A to point B to point C to point D and never know where you're at. So we're here on the old New York uh, set at, at Burbank. Talk us through where the Blade Runner locations were. Over there is where we did the Zora chase through the, uh, through the uh, shop front. Where the Art Deco is. Where the Art Deco is now. It was a shop front with a plate glass. Over here is the Leon Hotel. Just up there? Yep. Over there is Mr. Chu's shop. Oh, this is Chu's Ice House. This is there? the Ice House. OK. And then straight ahead of us, right down there, that's the night scene. What happens there? That's the night there? scene where the midgets come through and the, and the, and the masses of people coming through at night with the, uh, with the Hare Krishnas. And uh, as you can see over here, because there's so much greenery and mountainside, that was one of the main reasons why we decided to shoot at night, because we could eliminate having to mat out the, the green mountains and the trees. Because and the, if you look everything. down the end of the street, you can just yep. see yeah. glorious hills. Exactly. And just over here on the corner was the, the phone booth. There was no stairs here. There was just a phone booth in which it, where Batty made the phone call before the, the I-Man. So how far down was this set dressed as, as Blade Runner? Was it All everywhere it. you can see? We took over everything. You arrived onto the set and you're transported. Your job as an actress is so easy because you're already in some place that's absolutely, you know, magical, absolutely from, from, somebody, some, from somebody's imagination. The premise was that, in my design sort of mind, that with these enormous structures going up 2,000, 3,000 feet, decent people never went below the 60th floor. So you had these big pylons and supporting the architecture. And the street then became like a basement, essentially, an urban basement. Sid is this wonderful combination of artist and practitioner and sociologist. He can talk for hours about the logic of urban planning, urban decay and sociological decay and disorder. And so I introduced him to the deal because I saw the book and thought, that's really interesting. And this guy's got a real, his finger on what could happen and where it's liable to go. As well as the Warner backlot, Blade Runner also took in and transformed a number of existing locations in and around LA. Union Station, for example, became Police HQ, where Captain Bryant first sets Deckard on the trail of the errant replicants. This Frank Lloyd Wright design house in Los Feliz doubled as the first floor exterior of Deckard's apartment. As he wends his weary way home, Blade Runner's bedraggled hero drives his sedan through the Second Street Tunnel, which runs between Hill and Figueroa, and which looks as eerily exotic in real life as it does in the film. Describe in single words only the good things that come into your mind about your mother. Most famously, Blade Runner also utilized this, the legendary Bradbury Building, just across the street from the Million Dollar Theater on Broadway in downtown LA. It's here that Pris holds up with her only human friend, J.F. Sebastian, and where Deckard finally comes face to face with Roy Batty. The Bradbury was designed at the end of the 19th century by George Wyman, who had been inspired both by messages from a Ouija board and by the architecture of Edward Bellamy's futuristic novel Looking Backward, set incidentally in the year 2000. It was the perfect location for Blade Runner's retrofitting process, through which buildings would come to embody the synthesis of past, present and future. I found out he, before I left, in, in the beginning of pre-production, that he'd gone to the Bradbury building to look at that, and I said, and, 
I said, really, that's ridiculous. Every TV show in the world has used that building. And uh, that's a bad idea. Don't use that building. And he said, not the way I'll use it. And I thought, what arrogance. And I was so wrong. That means he knew what he talked about, you know, that he could make that a spectacular moment in the movie. I love to work with illustrators and storyboard artists and really the best production designers I can lay my hands on because that's where the fun is and that's when you start firing off an idea and then they fire back and suddenly the whole thing starts to generate this environment which is fascinating. The biggest uh, challenge was the Voight Kampf machine. Deckard brings it with him into, the, into Tyrell's office and so forth. So it had to be a suitcase, briefcase size thing and in my mind it had to be terrifying. And this machine was breathing because it would inhale the air, the localized air between the interviewer and the interviewee, and process that and pick up, you know, acidic traces and, and so forth, much as animals do, because animals can smell if you're afraid. While Sid Mead's Voigt Camp machine was tasting the futuristic air, the cast and crew of Blade Runner found themselves unwillingly inhaling smoke and fumes on sets whose atmosphere pushed tolerance to the limits on a 24-hour basis. The conditions we were shooting in were so unbearable. It was boiling hot, it was wet, it was damp, it was, it was, it was, everybody was sitting in their underwear shooting and, you know, Ridley would finish shooting and just walk off. We shot for I think something like five months, and um, I think almost all of it was night shoots. I, I don't remember ever seeing the light of day, <laughs> except for um, the last few minutes on my drive home. Oh, man, the crew was walking around with surgical masks on. I mean, you would think you were down in a coal mine. This was Ridley's dream and Ridley's vision, and he would not back off, and all the powers that be on top of it, you know, would, there was enormous pressure going on. I didn't know anyone in L.A., and they didn't know me, which is worse. So the process of saying, no, I don't want it that way, I want it that way, um, took longer. And that's how we got behind. We wouldn't know anything, we wouldn't get any word of anything, and it would take hours to reset the shots. Um, and through one's own volition, you started to super exceed what you were capable of. And all the running stuff was phenomenal, and that, would, that went on for nights. It, it, we just kept going and going and running and running. I mean, I, I don't know how I didn't break bones in that. All the jumping and jumping on the cars and knocking do guys down. <laughs> I could feel the pressure almost all the time uh, that, that I was on the set. Um, uh, possibly one of the worst pressure conditions I have ever been in. I just do eyes. See? Just eyes. Genetic design. Just eyes. Every ounce of energy, every bit of concentration was to create the scene he wanted, you know. And, and the thing, of course, is he wants perfection. And uh, in the most gentle but most demanding way, he would tell you what he wants. Sit down, pal. Come on, don't be an asshole, Decker. I've got four skin jobs walking the streets. We had Union Station in Los Angeles, and they spent the whole day lighting it, lighting it, lighting it. And then we finally got, we had, you know, a half hour we had to do the dialogue. You know, all this other was just preliminary, and then we gotta get it, we gotta get it, we gotta get it, you know. I think he was indulgent. I think I saw 13 or 14 or 15 takes at times so that you couldn't tell the difference between one and the other. And many times I asked him, why did he do it? And he said, well, in the back do you see the shadow? I wanted a bigger shadow. And I often thought, if my mother is looking at that shadow, we don't have a picture. And eventually I just, uh, I give, uh, you know, on the film I became a screamer, I got really angry. And, uh, which is not good, because you, screaming doesn't get you anywhere, really. But just out of sheer frustration. Who did you scream at? Oh, just quite, you know, constant questions. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? I don't care how we're going to do this and how we're going to do this. It's when it's why are you doing this. That's really annoying, because I'm pretty qualified at this point. 
And I said, oh my God, I almost forgot I'm an actor because it's fun. I like, it's fun. It's supposed to be fun. It's not supposed to be this all the day, all the day, every day, you know. It wasn't willful on anybody's side. It just simply was that they were dealing with people they weren't used to dealing with or a director they weren't used to dealing with particularly. And they weren't um, detailed people like Ridley. They weren't perfectionists like Ridley. It's fair to say that Harrison and I were nearly always quarrelling. And I think I lay that down uh, partly at my feet, partly to do with the fact that I think I was so used to getting my own way. There was not much connection between him and the actors. I think that was another, another reason why Harrison got so frustrated with Ridley, because Harrison at the time needed direction and Ridley is, is more of a an art director, more of a cameraman, and not at that time was not much of it, so much of a, an actor's director. I'm not one given then, I am now, because I, I figure it's a mistake. I'm not one given then to spending a lot of time on explanation and stroking, right? I've got too much to do, you know, to get what I want, because I have a performance as well. I'd spent a year with Blade Runner, I knew it inside out. And uh, all that Harrison had to do was trust me. And, uh, but Harrison's not used to working that way. Harrison's very involved. And I can understand that. And I think he was awfully good in the movie. And I still think he doesn't talk about it, which is a great pity because I still believe it's one of his best uh, films. The replicants were all such great characters and and Harrison Ford's character is such a dumb character he gets a gun, a gun put to his head and then he fucks a dishwasher and then he, he falls in love with her it doesn't make any sense he's introduced as you know this detective hero but he's not the hero he's the bad guy his role didn't seem to fit him or he couldn't make it fit. Uh, I know that, that that was going on, and I don't know wh why, but uh, if, if, he, if he would have been stronger, I would have not been so shiny, you know. So productive was Rutger's relationship with Ridley that the relatively unknown Dutch actor soon became the unexpected star of the film, connecting with his director's European sensibility and even writing Blade Runner's most memorable couplet. At 3 a.m. in the morning on the last day, and it's, we're two hours from dawn, because we're nearly in the summer months, I think, yeah? And it's already gone blue. So I go to the trailer and say to him, OK, you've got to get out there now, we're ready. And he said, look, <clears throat> I've got these words. He said, I'd just been noodling with them over dinner t tonight. That was like one o'clock in the morning. Um, can I just say them? And I, said, and, I, and I said, okay, say them. So I sat in this trailer and I heard them. And uh, that was it. I thought it was beautiful. Rutger read those lines and then kept on going. And he had a bunch of other stuff, which included the tears in the rain and everything. And then he looked at me very sheepishly, like I've been a naughty boy, you know, like, you know, he's an actor and he'd written these lines. Well, I had two lines that I kind of liked for their, what they, what they pictured, you know, in the universe. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. <laughs> Attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion. I watched sea beams glitter in the dark near the ten house gate. There's only so much poetry you can get rid of, you know, and these images are so strong. And then, you know, I came up with the line, all those moments will be lost in time like tears and rain.
Although Blade Runner's principal photography was completed by July of 1981, the post-production period during which music, special effects and of course a controversial voiceover were added continued right up until the film's opening in June 82. It was to be a long and difficult year, characterised by arduous edits, confused test screenings, radical recuts and even the addition of an entirely new happy ending all played out against increasingly unhappy relations between the movie makers and the money men, kicking off on July the 11th, 1981, with the official firing from Blade Runner of producer Michael Dealey and director Ridley Scott. We were technically fired. We weren't fired in the sense that we, we still came to work every day and worked. That, that's not normal if you're fired, but we were technically, um, on paper, they didn't require our service anymore. Um, and the reason for that is they were permitted to do that because we were 10% of a budget. I tried to articulate to, to Ridley later on that, that he's taking money that should be in my children, so that I'm now digging into my, to my personal money because of, his, uh, because of his letting the picture go on and on and on and on and on. Somehow they feel that I thought, you know, irresponsibly and just went over anyway with a kind of fuck you attitude. And of course, because I'm died in the wool businessman by that point, it hurt me that I went over. I hated going over. It was just a piece of absolute rubbish and ill-mannered rubbish at that. Um, they were going to end the, finish the picture without the director. What are they talking about? I mean, it's just a piece of very stupid rudeness. I wasn't too concerned about whether somebody was happy or not happy. I was now hanging out the window saying, wait a minute, you know, I, this has become a nightmare. And I, you know, fired up and he said, you know, Michael goes, ah, ta, 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 ta. let's talk outside. So we talked outside. He said, I suggest what you do is get onto your union. And so I did. And um, I've been very impressed by the DGA ever since. They corrected the process instantly. As Yorkin, Dealey and Scott worked through their differences in the aftermath of principal photography, the landscape of Blade Runner continued to grow under the eyes of the special effects team, led by visual wizard Douglas Trumbull, director of the sci-fi classic Silent Running, and a key creative player in such genre hits as Kubrick's 2001 and Spielberg's Close Encounters. Doug is a natural scientist, and uh, you give him a problem, he said, let me think about it, and he'd come back with a, with a solution within a couple of days. The look of Blade Runner is totally unique and fresh and was done relatively inexpensively and quickly. And, uh, and I think the result really met what Ridley wanted to see and blended with the rest of the movie. Ridley kept looking at what we had and said, I want to see more, I want more vastness. And I kept saying, really, we don't have the money. He's not easy to please, and we like that. And that's, that's a good thing, because uh, all the guys working on it, you got to remember, this is a very young crew, and totally uh, couldn't wait to wake up the next morning. You go to midnight, you couldn't wait to wake up to get back to work the next day. What was going to be there? What you're really looking at in the Hades landscape is what we call a forced perspective miniature. A building in the foreground might have been a foot tall, a building midway back might have been four inches tall, and a building at the far distance might have been one inch tall, but that whole distance from foreground to background would be about eight feet. It was very quick to make, and then thousands of tiny fiber optic bundles coming up through the bottom of the floor and into those buildings to light them up. Once you have that all in place with the lights and the buildings and the fiber optics, we filled that room with so much smoke that you couldn't see from here to the wall. At some point in the process, uh, and I wasn't directly involved, so I don't know exactly what happened, but I understand that Philip Dick was reasonably unhappy. Katie Haber gave me a call and said, put together the best of the best in a reel. And it was left to me to go in with a few of my key people and he and his friend to go down and sit in the screening room and, uh, and he said very little and I said roll it and it went dark. The 10 minutes of optical takes ran. The lights came up. Philip turned around, looked me right in the eyes and he says, how is this possible? I don't understand this. 
He says, this feels exactly like what I had in my head when I was writing it. How does this happen? At that moment, it was probably the best moment in my career because I said, we nailed it, we got it. As Philip Dick was marveling at the special effects, Ridley Scott and editor Terry Rawlings were attempting to lock down a rough cut of Blade Runner. And as they did so, they began to discard incidental scenes, such as Deckard's hospital meeting with his injured colleague Holden, excised from all released versions of the film and seen here for the very first time. This little scene was originally scripted where he would go from Bryant's office and go interview Holden and find out what he could find from, from Holden about what was going on. And that's this particular scene. What you reading? Old favorite, Tracer Island. Deckard. Good friend. It ain't like it used to be, Deck. It's tough now. These replicants aren't just a bunch of muscle miners anymore. They're no goddamn different than you or me. What happened? Ten days ago, security at Terrell Corp finds three intruders in the records room. Kills one, two get away, okay? They do a routine autopsy on the one that gets aired. And what do you know? A skin job. One of the ones that busted out. Top drawer replicant, combat type, and that's for six. I decided to check out all the new employees at Terrell. I avoid conf 26 boring assholes when in walks this Lee on somebody. Nothing special, but very big. Were you getting anything on the machine? Yeah, I thought... <laughs> I thought maybe I was getting something. Maybe it doesn't work on these deck. Maybe I was too slow, who knows? Maybe. It's all over again. It's a wipeout. They're almost us. When the rough cutting was finished, Blade Runner was test screened in front of audiences to see how they'd react to Scott's dark fantasy. The results of those early tests were even more disturbing than the film itself. We sat around in the manager's office afterwards and uh, it was rather bleak. And Harrison was being positive actually, saying, I think they liked it, didn't you? I said, I don't know, right? We were waiting for the cards. I mean, they've said it looks amazing, but what the hell's going on? And that's when all the, the panic really set in. We all were just destroyed. I mean, we were really sat there just like he'd been hit on the head with a baseball bat, and I did too. And the decision was that we needed a clarification. We needed a voiceover. Recreational they don't advertise for killers in a newspaper. That was my profession, ex-cop. Ex-Blade Runner, ex-killer. I was there when Harrison did it, and it was just horrendous. It was like a sort of what Ridley calls Irving the Explainer, you know, and my name is Deckard, and now I am an android catcher, and, you know. And Harrison hated it so much that he did it really, really badly, hoping they wouldn't use it, and they did. I never heard that from Harrison, ever, that he hated it. If he did, he never told me. <laughs> Along with Harrison's new voiceover, Blade Runner was also now saddled with a happy ending in which Deckard and Rachel escape into a lush green landscape actually constructed from outtakes from Stanley Kubrick's horror hit, The Shining. I always remember that we had sort of 30,000 feet turn up. We wanted about four shots or something. So we had 30,000, every outtake he did came up, which was good, but uh, it was tacky. The whole idea of the end was tacky, in my opinion. It always was right when they shut that door. Although opinion was divided about Blade Runner's narration and upbeat ending, there was a chorus of approval for the score, which would become one of the defining soundtracks of sci-fi cinema and win international plaudits for Greek composer Vangelis. He will sit and watch every frame and cue off a frame, cue off an expression of the actor. He doesn't just lay on score and say, well, that works. He goes through everything. He thinks himself into the film. I remember, you know, when the first notes hit me, I was like, wow. You get that, and this, the whole first image comes up with the city. If that doesn't knock your socks off, then you, you, are, 
you know, just know that. I loved it. I was very really happy with it. I was really shocked that it didn't um, receive as much attention initially as I, th as I thought that it would. I didn't think it was surprising. As I say, it was disappointing. I always hoped, well, you know, it will be. It would have little life. Yeah, I mm. certainly hoped it would make do a lot back, better. And I, and I even I was was a little surprised that the reviews were as bad as they were. Well, but it's a, it was a failure, basically. I mean, it was that's a all it was. It was a yeah. Failure yeah. is yeah. even, yeah. you know, it was. No one liked it. It was a financial, you know, loss. I mean, I, I saw the audience. They were like split. It was like the Red Sea. You know, here was the people uh, that really were like stunned, and here were the people who were pissed off. You know. That's not L.A., it's so depressing. Ah, you know, that's not my town. No, it's not. Jesus. <laughs> to me, it was never intended as a commercial film. I mean, obviously they wanted it to make money because you don't make them to lose money. But it was, it was more a... I always thought of it as more of an art film. It was like an art, a, a grandiose art film. It really? cost $28 million. Yeah, a lot of money at that time. And what did it take? 17, 16? Not a good bet, really, was it? The downbeat opening of Blade Runner in the summer of 82 was a disappointment both for the filmmakers and the financiers, who recouped only around half their investment from its initial theatrical run. But like the androids of Philip Dick's novel, Blade Runner wouldn't simply lie down and die quietly. In fact, due to the burgeoning home video market, it soon found itself a growing army of fans who discovered that each subsequent viewing unearthed new hidden treasures. And it was those fans, with their obsessive interest both in the film and its tortured production history, who eventually helped bring about a full-scale rebirth of Blade Runner, after a 70mm print of Ridley Scott's original cut was accidentally screened at the Fairfax Theatre in Los Angeles in May 1990. I remember going there, I was working with David Fincher on Alien 3 and we went down to see it because he's an avid Ridley Scott fan. Yeah, and we saw that, no titles on it or anything, it was just sent out as it was and uh, fantastic, the audience reaction, that's what I thought was incredible, to be in there with them and there's, you can hear them saying, wow, there's no, there's no dart, no commentary and uh, all this stuff, it was really good, it was like what we intended. Such was the audience enthusiasm for this early print that Warners promptly authorised the production and release of a so-called director's cut, supervised by respected film archivist Michael Arick, to bring Blade Runner back into line with Ridley's original vision. The goal was to use the original release version as the spine and to go back and put in certain things that he missed and primarily take out the things he felt were damaging, like the narration and, and the tacked on happy ending. I'm very satisfied. Um, I think I'm glad we got the voiceover off. I'm glad we got the ending off. The ending didn't make any sense at all. And the ending the way we have it right now is fine. I wish I'd had a bit more action early on. Um, just pure action, just to r raise the blood. But I, I, obviously people don't need that now because they get the film. It's taken 20 years really for people to appreciate it. Um, and see it as sort of a first of its kind. I mean, now there's so many movies that have ripped off aspects of Blade Runner. It's people who, who don't know the film might, might not even think it was original, you know? It was a very dim and dismal vision of what the future of America was going to be all about. And funnily enough, we're living it now. I mean, you just go down onto Skid Row and you see the squalor and the, 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 the human waste that is down there. and, and and, and the multinational, multi-ethnic ethnicity of, of, of Los Angeles is now very evident. And everything that it, it said LA was going to be, it's slowly but surely creeping into reality. What we'd done, I think, was a kind of rather, was a dark novel. It was rather novelistic. And uh, I didn't really realize that that eventually became the true longevity and value of the film, is that you can revisit, revisit it constantly like rereading maybe one of your favorite books and it, you always find you always find you get sucked in again i still think it's one of the best films i've made the commercial and critical revival of scott's movie in the 90s suggested that history had finally caught up with blade runner 
Indeed, wherever you looked, from the pages of cyberpunk fiction to the visuals of sci-fi cinema, the style of MTV, and even the design of multimedia advertising and communication, it was clear that Blade Runner had actually shaped the face of the future. And the new director's cut, with its fleeting vision of a unicorn, also posed a question which has become the key enigma of Blade Runner, the possibility that even its human hero is actually a product of new technology, an android dreaming of electric sheep. So is Deckard really a replicant? Aha, uh -huh, I don't know. I still don't know. That is an enigma. No, I never thought he was a replicant. No, that, that's never, never in my mind. I think Deckard is a real guy, and I think he, he's in pain for it, and he knows he's going to live a long time and, like, suffer. Yes, of course he is. Otherwise, the movie doesn't make sense. You don't need just one more super-intelligent detective, you know, hunting these people down. Uh, Bryant calls him in deliberately. Uh, he's a replicant, and they all know it except Deckard. I know that Ridley wanted him to be, but I think that's kind of like a joke. And that's where the unicorn came from. When Harrison's on his piano, looking at all the photographs and wondering who these people are and what they're after, he's drinking, he's a bit drunk there, and as he drinks, you go off into the unicorn, so it's a reverie. And that was the only reference right there to this abstract image, which is a unicorn. Because at the end of it, he comes out of his thought process. And that never occurs again till the end of the movie. Because when he comes in that apartment, he thinks that he's gone in there and killed her. Because they know where she is. And uh, when they come out, there it is. Looks like a unicorn. And it means? That he's a replicant. Will we ever know? What we do know, though, is that this week's Sunday movie on 4 is Stephen King's chilling thriller, Misery, tomorrow at 10.